let's continue on with our uh, mafia stuff here. So we've got Frankie Carbo today. He was born uh, in a massive uh, Italian ghetto in the Lower East Side of New York. By age 11, 11, mind you, he was already an inmate, had been an inmate at the New York State Reformatory for juvenile delinquents. It was a horrible place. And then he would spend the next decade uh, after that bouncing in and out of jails and prisons and so forth. And he got up a record for himself. Grand larceny, assault, a lot of assault. And one murder charge, he killed a cab driver who refused to pay him protection money. And for that... He got, believe it or not, a mere 20 months in prison. And he was back out on the street, and he was in popular demand as a gunman and all-around thugs for these bootleg gangs that were starting to shape, take form. Frankie Carbo leaped up on the national scene in 1931 when he was accused, accurately, of murdering a Philadelphia hood named Mickey Duffy. The charges were dropped. It was one of seven times in his life that... Carbo would be accused of murder and seven times he walked away. He always had an airtight alibi. He did maybe a few months in jail as a suspect, blah, blah, blah. But he basically got away with those murders. Um, Duffy, by the Duffy was a Polish-American despite the name. His real name was Billy William Kusick. And he was a bear beer and he operated between Philadelphia and Atlantic City. A lot of territory. And he made a fortune. At least he did until Carbo caught up with him at the Ambassador Hotel in Atlantic City. He put five shots in him. It was a trademark, by the way, for Carbo to put five shots in his victims. The guys who paid for the murder probably were Duffy's own guys. The organization had gotten so big, they just didn't see why they needed Duffy around anymore. So they killed him and broke it up and took his empire. And that, in turn, was taken over by the Italian mobs up in New York. You know, in the show Boardwalk Empire, Duffy is portrayed as sort of a moron. Remember, he was the one with the bowler hat? That was a great series, uh, Boardwalk Empire. Really accurate. The writers did a great job with that. Uh, he was far from a moron, but the problem was he, he, would, he made a splash out of spending his money. He was trying to, to copy himself after Al Capone. He had an ego. A lot of those guys had huge egos. So if he bought an expensive Rolls Royce and he paid, let's say, $2,000 for it, that was more money than most people would make in a year, uh, he would call up a newspaper guy and say, hey, look what I just bought for my wife. He also kept a couple of hookers on the side and he, he, <laughs> he called the press and told them what great thing the hooker had done that day. So that was why he was portrayed as a moron, but he wasn't. He was In the early 1930s, uh, Frankie Carbo is making his living as a killer for Murder, Inc. And one of the guys he took out was Big Maxie Greenberg. What a great name. And Greenberg was murdered on the orders of Meyer Lansky and uh, Lucky Luciano, who were running a very profitable beer combo up in New York City. If they took out Greenberg, who was operating in northern New Jersey, that means that Z Abby Zwillman was involved. He would have had a say in that. Zwillman, uh, as a mystery behind him, years later he tried to earn his way into respectability. The federal government had him on a, on a pretty serious tax rap, so there's some question whether he killed himself, hung himself by the neck, or the, the mob did it for him to shut him up, because uh, there was a lot of doubt that he could do serious jail time, and the mob suspected he was just ratting everybody out. And, who knows, but it's all hearsay. There's nothing really solid to it. Greenberg had bounced uh, from Detroit. He had been with the Detroit mobs. He moved over to Egan's Rats in St. Louis. Uh, early on, he'd gone to New York and done a deal with Arnold Rothstein. So at the start of Prohibition, he worked for Rothstein. Then Rothstein was killed. Anyway, eventually he ends up in New York. He's running illegal booze with Waxy Gordon. Uh, who was, uh, I heard of, uh, Gordon I heard was a, a dope addict. Anyway, uh, then he moved to New Jersey in 1927, and he and Gordon and a gangster named uh, Max Hassel set up a really great beer empire. Uh, Waxy Gordon's job was to, to organize, Greenberg's was to intimidate. Max Hassel, Hassel was an expert at political payoff. He had a lot of political clout. 
So this empire they had, it went from northern New Jersey to New York to Philadelphia. They had 16 or 17 breweries spaced out between Buffalo, Elmira, Syracuse, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and somewhere in northern Maryland as well. And all of this, of course, came to the attention of New York guys. Look at Luciano and Lansky. They think, we got to have this. And just as they're about to probably work something out, they probably could have worked something out by talking their way into this, Dutch Schultz shows up, and he figures, because he was nuts, he would just machine gun his way into this and kill everybody. So Luciano and Lansky realize before Schultz gets moving, they, and they, they've got to do something. They made uh, an outreach to the Three Hoods, and they were rejected. So they went to uh, Waxy Gordon, and they said, look, we need you to uh, hand us Greenberg and Hassel. We're going to kill them, and you can run things for us, and you'll become richer than rich. Apparently, Gordon agreed, and in April of 1933, Greenberg and Hassel, they go to the Carteret Hotel in Elizabeth, New Jersey, for a meeting with Gordon. Gordon manages to slip out of the meeting for who knows one reason or another. And in comes Frankie Garbo, guns blasting. He shoots Hassel and Greenberg five times each, murders them both. Uh, let me add something about Garbo. There's a story going around that he was the one, one of the stories that he killed Bugsy Siegel. There's a hundred stories about who killed him, why he was killed, and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to post a story. I did a lot of research. I believe seriously it wasn't a mob hit at all. They, why would they? He was making money for them long term that he was stealing from the casino. They're thieves. That's what they do. They expected him to steal. Uh, instead, I, I very much believe, and I'll post this story. I have a written version of, on my writer site, but I'm fairly positive it was a, a vet who had just come back from World War II. He'd been a sharpshooter. Uh, he just, he was crazy actually before he went in the army. Being in action made him even crazier. And he lived across the mall down a bit in his mother's home. Uh, and he had gone uh, from where Siegel was murdered from the house Siegel was staying in. And he's the guy who killed Siegel. It wasn't Carbo. I'm, I'm pretty positive of that. So the next murder, sensational murder, that Carbo gets involved with was with the murder of a West Coast hood named uh, Big Greeny Greenberg. It was in 1939. He was a labor racketeer, and he'd gone out west uh, to hook up with Bugsy Siegel. They were pals. The problem was uh, Lepke Buckhalter had been indicted. He was going to have to talk about Murder, Inc., and the state gets Big Greeny as a potential witness. Greenberg goes to Lepke Buckhalter, of all people, Lucky, Lucky Buckhalter runs Murder, Inc. He's a vicious guy. And he says, if you give me 5000 which was a lot more money in 1939 than it sounds like today, I, I won't testify against you. So Buckhalter, you know, he's a thug. He just figures, well, it's cheaper to kill this guy. And not only that, it'll, it'll make sure he never changes his mind. So he gets Bugsy Siegel. And Siegel's guy, a hood named Whitey Krakow, who was killed just a year after Greenberg was killed. And the three of them, Carbo, the three of them, they get together. Carbo does a shooting. He puts five bullets into Greenberg's head in his driveway, in his car. The body falls out onto the driveway, half in the driveway, half in the car. And uh, unfortunately, Greenberg's wife found the body. Oof. So by the 1940s, Carbo, he's now a made guy in the Lucchese crime family. He's really up and coming. He goes into the boxing game. He becomes a promoter, fight fixer, uh, really manipulated the sport unfortunately I'm a fight fan for about two decades just awful the things they did uh, they cheated fighters they, they fixed fights uh, guys who, who could have been great fighters were, were relegated to nothing it's a shame they had uh, an interest I should tell you who it was Carbo and Frankie Palermo Blinky Palermo who was a punk I know who they had a, a, an interest in Sonny Liston who became champ in 1962. In fairness, uh, Liston, by the way, used to be a, an enforcer, a thug uh, for the mob, uh, for the, and the labor rackets. But anyway, Liston 
all that aside was one hell of a good fighter you know one of the toughest fighters it was his liston's murder uh i, I shouldn't say murder potential suicide uh, who knows he was a drug addict towards the end of his life so who knows what happened a lot of people think he was uh, he was murdered for a lot of different reasons murdered by the mob uh, Carbo's interest in Liston wasn't, he had money in him, but by that time, by 1962, uh, Carbo was in jail. So anyway, in the late 1950s, he gets jailed, he gets released, Carbo gets released from prison in 1960, and he's hauled before the McClellan uh, Senate Committee looking into organized crime, and Bobby Kennedy is questioning him. Bobby Kennedy was the attorney for the, for the committee about how the mob uh, had taken over boxing and <laughs> Carbo gives the statement I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself that isn't actually the law but whatever he gives it 27 times so Bobby Kennedy never forgets him a year later Bobby Kennedy is now Attorney General he gets Palermo and Carbo on conspiracy and extortion of a welterweight named Don Jordan it was a hell of a good fighter anyway He's found guilty. He's sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. Prison. He gets a mercy parole due to ill health, and he's set to Miami Beach. I, I I wonder how sick he actually was because it took him a while to die, and he goes to Miami Beach. I mean, if you gotta die, dying in Miami Beach is a good place to go. And he dies in 1976.